Apparently someone wanted to go advance first, but he must be an overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go ahead and start with basic. We're going to talk about um, the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. That's the foundation of this. If you don't understand how it works, then you don't know how to treat it. We're going to talk about what regulates respiration, um, how to measure respiratory function, and is your patient actually having adequate function. We'll talk about respiratory problems, the assessment of the respiratory system, and some non-invasive monitoring systems you guys will be using. Am I loud enough? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> so, functions of the respiratory system. You guys alluded to it a few minutes ago. Um, it, the main function is gas exchange. It brings oxygen into our body for our cells to use in our tissues and exchanges CO2. That happens all in the lungs. Um, if we don't get rid of our carbon dioxide, our bodies get acidotic and we die. If we don't get oxygen, we get anoxic and we die. So it's one of the most important systems and most important for you to learn and manage. Um, the respiratory system helps regulate pH, uh, that by the carbon dioxide in our system, like I said, CO2 goes up, your pH goes down, you get acidotic. Um, it protects us against inhaled pathogens um, and irritants, and it helps us vocalize. So here is a picture of the structures we're going to learn about for the most part. I like this because there's extra things we're not going to learn about, but it's pretty much, this is a good overview of what we're going to talk about as far as anatomy. You've got the upper airway, basically from the larynx up, and trachea down is considered lower airway. Um, <clears throat> a big part of the airway is the thoracic cage. Um, the thoracic cage consists of the ribs, the sternum, the spine and the diaphragm. That gives your chest a bony structure um, that supports the breathing and helps provide a negative and positive pressure that makes the air go in and out of your chest. I'll talk about that later, the physiology of the uh, respiratory, respiratory cycle. The diaphragm, not shown in this picture, but it's a dome-shaped membrane that sits kind of right here. And um, when it flattens out and comes down, it causes a negative pressure intrathoracically, and air comes into the lungs. And then when it relaxes and comes back up, air gets pushed back out of the lungs. So. <clears throat> Just another picture of the thoracic cage showing the muscles of inspiration and expiration. Um, so the, the thoracic cage, all, the diaphragm moves and causes the breath, but the thoracic cage also moves. Um, and causes breath. So when you inspire, the thoracic cage moves up and out, and that causes a negative pressure in the chest and pulls air in through your mouth and nose into your lungs. The muscles that do that are the sternocleidomastoids up here, uh, and the scalenes up there. The external intercostals and the diaphragm are the muscles of inspiration. I, for the longest time, had a hard time remembering um, I knew there were intercostals on in inspiration and expiration. I couldn't remember if ex external intercostals were inspiration or expiration and vice versa for internal. One way to remember it is their opposite. External for inspiration, internal for expiration. Um, but it's a popular, in anesthesia, that's a popular stump your test question. So I like to tell people how to remember that. And then the muscles of expiration are the internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles. Are those all accessory muscles or no? Um, I would say abdominals are accessories. Um, and it, it, the sternocleidomastoid and the scalene, the intercostals um, pretty much work all the time when you breathe. The other, the intercostals and the diaphragm work all the time when you breathe. The other ones are for force inhalation and exhalation. So. so talk a little bit about Boyle's Law. Uh, it basically talks about pressure and volume have an inverse relationship. So as the pressure decreases, the volume is going to increase. 
or vice versa, increase in volume means lower pressure. Basically, when the pressure drops in your thoracic cavity, the volume should <coughs> increase because it just sucks air down into your lungs. The ribs move up and out, the diaphragm flattens, and the um, chest volume increases. And then, opposite happens, the volume decreases as the pressure gets higher intrathoracically. Um, your ribs fall, your diaphragm moves up, and it pushes the air out, decreasing the volume in your chest. So Boyle's Law is a physiological law. I'm not sure if they talk about that in your book or not, but it's the physical law that um, describes inspiration and expiration. So the upper airway, again, this one has, I, I don't think you really need to know about the sinuses, but it's good to know that they're there. Um, we're going to talk about the upper airway here. So the nasal cavity is the superior part of the airway. Um, inside the nasal cavity, you know, I'm going to talk about this and leave that picture up so you can see. In the nasal cavity, you've got these little lines here. Uh, they're actually little bony structures um, with lots of uh, capillaries in them, big blood flow here. It separates the nasal cavity into three different parts. And why it does this is it causes turbulent flow of air to come in and warms the air as it comes in through the nose to go down to the lungs because you don't want your lungs to get cold air. Um, so those are the turbinates. There's an inferior, middle, and superior turbinate. They also have um, uh, mucus. That's what part of what produces the mucus, and that helps clean the air of debris as you inhale. And then the um, olfactory nerves are located in here also, and that's what produces smell. Uh, olfactory nerve, anyone know what cranial nerve that is? 12? 2, 3, 1. 1. <laughs> we would have gotten eventually, guys. <laughs> There's only 12 of them, so. <laughs> so, um, the sinuses here, there's several sinuses. Um, they're air-filled cavities, um, they're mucus-lined, and they, again, <coughs> just try to help capture trapped bacteria and debris as you inhale. Um, the uh -huh. Auditory tubes, I have a hard time saying the spatium tubes. Um, <laughs> they show them down right here. These are the tubes right here. They go from your nasal cavity to your ears and help regulate pressure in your ears when your ears pop, that's why. That little thing there. Um, they connect to the middle ear, and they equalize pressure in the eardrum. And then there's the nasal lacrimal ducts. I don't see them on here. Basically, it helps uh, drain tears and debris from the eyes into the nasal cavity. That's why you get stuffed up when you cry. There's probably not many of you that cry in here. No. <laughs> Never. Never. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah, before this test. <laughs> No, <laughs> but I have seen the test, and I, I will talk about everything that's on the test. Um, so the oral cavity, you've got the lips, the teeth, the gums, the hard and soft palate. Um, hard palate is just this bony structure here, soft palate is a non-bony structure that forms the palate. You've got the tongue and the cheeks. That basically creates the oral cavity. <clears throat> Let's see. Leave my notes here, see if there's anything special in that. Um, the upper airway can be, or the oral cavity can be an important, it is a huge part of intubation because that's the, usually the path you're taking to intubate a patient. And um, you can have trauma and bleeding and swelling in this area that prevent you from even getting down <coughs> the airway with a tube or visualization. Also, for whatever reason, people like to pierce things in their mouth, and that can get in your way uh, of intubating. I've seen the uvula pierce, the tongue, oh, wow. what? The lips, what yeah. Ugh. So it, it's there, and you will see it. So be cautious with that. So you take them out if you have to, right? If the patient is awake, I have them remove it. Um, if you have time, you can take them out. But if you see it, just be real cautious of it because you can hook your blade on a piercing, or you can um, cut their lips and cause more bleeding, um, just causes more trauma. 
I make all my patients take out all their pierce, facial piercings before I do any anesthesia on them. It's real fun when you have a laboring mom and say, I'm not going to give you an epidural until that tongue ring comes out. Eight months, <laughs> <laughs> they, like, put their fingers way down in their throat to get that one out, or how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> how do they get that one out? I, I think Flyers? they just go down and, ooh, I don't know. I don't know how it comes out, but, yeah. yeah. So, you're not a fan of piercing with one piece of Well, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> I don't have any. Um, then the oral pharynx is behind, it's kind of this area too. It's got the tonsils in it. Um, the uvula hangs down. If the oral pharynx is considered the posterior third of the tongue, this little area here. And the nasal pharynx is kind of behind, the, above the soft palate. So you've got the nasal pharynx and oral pharynx and larynx right here. Okay, so uh, the word pharynx uh, is Latin. It means a gulf or a chasm or a gap or continuity in a deep fissure or a cleft. So it's just kind of a, a space, basically. Um, they have dual purposes for respiration and ingestion of food. So it's a spot where stuff can get caught. Um, let's see. The pharynx is also the location of a lot of muscular activity with coughing, swallowing, and, and the gag reflex. And then the larynx um, is right here, the structure. And it is what contains the um, voice box, basically. It's the connection between the oral pharynx and the, lar and the uh, trachea, is the larynx. I think I have a picture of that. Here we go. Here's the larynx. So the larynx, this is your intubation anatomy. Um, this is important to know. This is the anterior view, so view like this. And then the posterior view, if you were to look through like this, and then a lateral uh, or a cross section view. Yeah. <clears throat> the important things to know are the thyroid cartilage, this right here, your Adam's apple. If you, you can feel it if you swallow it moves up and down. That, you need to learn how to identify that because this little membrane here is where you're going to crack some more. It's the cricothyroid membrane. So it's between the thyroid cartilage and the cricothyroid cartilage is the cricothyroid membrane. And that is where you're going to save someone's life if you can't get the other one. Um, epiglottis is right here. It's the little flap in the airway that closes the airway off as you swallow. It also is the point where you put your blades to intubate people. The curved blade goes behind the epiglottis and the straight blade lifts the epiglottis up to reveal the vocal cords. So I'm sorry, you said uh, cricoid cartilage. That's not where we're going, that's just our spot. And then we go up to right yep. there. You feel for the thyroid cartilage and um, between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, you feel a soft little membranous hole. And that's where you're going to poke to do a cricoid. And we'll What's talk that about that in a second. The cricothyroid membrane. Okay. <clears throat> I would challenge you to find that on yourselves and on each other and get good, go home and feel it on your kids and your wives <coughs> and your husbands. Um, get good at feeling that. Um, and all sorts of body habits that you need to be able to identify that structure. This thyroid cartilage is also the point where you can manipulate the airway or have someone manipulate the airway when you're intubating. You can kind of move the vocal cords down and into view if you're having a hard time viewing the vocal cords. So this is a real, does everyone want to try and feel it right now? Just go ahead and swallow and feel the part that moves and it's going to be a kind of a hard cartilage structure. And then if you rock your finger down, you'll feel that cricothyroid membrane. It takes some practice to feel, but I think I don't know. Let's poke it and find out. Okay. Um, other important things to know are the 
uh, cuneiform cartilage and the corniculate cartilage and the retinoid cartilages. These, in general, are called the retinoid cartilages. Um, or the posterior cartilages is another name for them. I think that's the term your book uses, but I'm not sure. Um, these, right above these cartilages, and I'll show you an actual tissue view of these. You can see these um, when you intubate. These are landmarks that you're looking for when you're intubating. Um, right above the retinoid cartilages are your vocal cords, your target for your tube. <coughs> so those are important. They are, can also, um, there's sites of muscle attachment that cause phonation, um, that close and open your vocal cords, um, and they can be damaged with a rough intubation. You can actually disarticulate these things if you're not careful with the airway. Um, and disarticulation of these means the vocal cords can slam shut and then the patient can't breathe and you actually cannot get to through shut vocal cords. I've tried. What did you call them before you call them the posterior cartilages? Um, they're the, there's three of them. There's the cuneiform, the corniculate, and the retinoid cartilages. Okay. And you can call them posterior cartilages or you can call them a retinoid. Like, a lot of times when you're intubating in the OR, we'll say, do you see the retinoids? And in the advanced airway, I think is where you'll see pictures of these. In so are, are those the actual vocal cords that you will see? No, nope. those are they're little pink bumps that you'll see in the airway. And there's they're symmetrical, so there's three of them in line on each side. And then in between those, you'll see the white vocal cords. That's what the muscles in the vocal cords attach to. Okay, another important structure here is the vellecula. So you've got your epiglottis right here that closes over the airway when you swallow. Your curved blade when you go in to intubate someone is going to go right in this spot called the vellecula. And there's a ligament there that moves, that supports the vellecula when it moves. You're going to push on that ligament and it's just going to lift that vellecula up and you'll support. It's amazing. Um, so that's a term to remember. So tracheal cartilages, important to note that in the anterior view, there's tracheal cartilages. You can feel them in most people. Um, posterior view, though, there's no, they, they don't completely encompass the trachea. So uh, it should be soft on the posterior view. And I actually felt this in real life this weekend on a bad airway case. My hands were in someone's throat. <laughs> it's crazy. I'll tell you that story this afternoon. Um, but yeah, the back of that is very smooth. When you're feeling for tracheal rings, then don't. It's scary. <clears throat> so this is just more of a view, anterior and posterior view. Um, they're calling the cricothyroid ligament, the intrinsic ligament here. That is an uncommon term. It's more, more commonly called the cricothyroid ligament because it's in between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. So, um, and this one, you said membrane? Crico, thyroid membrane. Is it for a ligament as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, the hyoid bone of interest, it doesn't really matter for your test, but it's the only bone in the airway and it does not articulate with any other bone. It just kind of sits there with the cartilage and stuff attached to it. So. Okay. Again, I'm going to leave this picture up while I talk about the anatomy. So the epiglottis is a cartilaginous flap that protects the airway during swallow, right here. It's also the site for your blade, um, depending on what blade you're using. We talked about the hyoid bone. The thyroid cartilage is, again, the Adam's apple. It moves up and down when you swallow. Um, that movement is because it's attached right here to the epiglottis, and the epiglottis closes and lifts the Adam's apple up. The cricoid cartilage is a complete ring of cartilage. It is the only complete ring that will go posterior. You can see it here. 
Um, and it's the site of the Selleck maneuver um, where you push the airway down uh, to include the esophagus during an RSI intubation. Because it's a complete ring, you can push it down and include the esophagus. Okay, and then the cricothyroid membrane is for the cric site. We talked about the vollecula, um, and it's the, the ligament, you can see what you saw in that other picture. This ligament here is also called the hypoepiglottic ligament, and that's where you put your curved leg penetrations. I know I'm repeating myself here, but I just want to go through all the slides. So the vollecula is also called, what did you say? Um, it's in your notes. It's the hypoepiglottic <coughs> ligament. And then the arytenoid cartilage is again right here. And I should have put in a, a picture for what you're going to see, but you'll see it later. All right. And then here's a picture of the soft tissues of the airway. Um, again, you've got the thyroid membrane and the cricoid membrane. Here's the cricothyroid, or I'm sorry, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, cricothyroid membrane. Um, uh, it's important to note that you've got lots of blood flow in the neck. You've got your common carotid and your internal um, and external jugular veins. And then the green stuff here is lymph tissue, part of the immune system. And then the yellow stuff in here is all the nerves that come off the neck. So lots of, lots of structures. Um, this big pink um, H-shaped thing here is the thyroid gland. It's very close to the point where you do a, a emergent crisis and you don't want to damage that. It's kind of an important gland. Regulates your uh, metabolism in your body. Um, okay. I'm going to put this picture back up. The vagus nerve. show it on here. The vagus nerve is in here also, so if you're manipulating the neck, it's kind of off to the side. Um, you can cause someone's potential bradycardia, stimulating the vagus nerve that's in here too. So if you're manipulating the neck and you get bradycardia, that's probably why. So this is kind of a hard picture to see. It's just another picture to show the upper respiratory tract versus the lower respiratory tract. We just talked about the upper. Once you get through the larynx and down into the trachea, that, that uh, defines your lower airway once you're in the trachea. <clears throat> so right here is your vocal cords right in here. Below that trachea, you feel all the tracheal rings going down to the carina where the trachea splits into the right and left main bronchus. Um, the rings that you see here are cartilaginous in the trachea. Once you hit the bronchus, those rings are muscles, muscular. They're smooth muscle. They're not cartilaginous. cartilaginous. Um, they're smooth muscle, which is important because that is the site of bronchospasm. If people are lungs are irritated, those muscles will clamp down and close off the airway. Um, also asthmatics, that's where asthma happens right in here with these uh, muscular rings. Um, out here in the distal airways, you have the alveoli and alveolar sacs. Um, I've got a better picture of it later. And then you've got on your left lobe of your lung, you've got two lobes. You've got an upper lobe and a lower lobe. And then on the right, you've got three lobes, upper, middle, and lower. Anyone know why you two on the left? The heart Good. Um, there's also lung parenchyma. Okay, so parenchyma is the lung tissue itself. And then you have um, pleural, uh, pleura. You've got the visceral pleura, which is a connective tissue that covers the lung tissue, the lung parenchyma. And then you've got the, um, so that's visceral, and then the parietal pleura attaches to the inside of your rib cage, and um, they're really smooth, slick surfaces that allow your lungs to move within your chest cavity. 
like this. But you can't see the plural on here, but um, it's important to know the different plural. another picture of the lower respiratory tract. Um, so this is just terminology. Um, so there's the trachea and then the primary bronchi and then every time it branches it goes to secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and so on. So when, when pulmonologists are bronchi patients they, they actually have names for all of these branches which they go down into. Um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on. Yeah. So the larynx is part of the lower. Larynx is upper. Larynx is the dividing line. Yeah. Well, the, the bottom of the upper. The yes. Part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're in the trachea, that's the. Uh, so larynx is upper, oh. and then once you're in the trachea, past beyond the vocal cords, is when you're in the lower. shows that smooth muscle in the bronchioles. Um, it just wraps around and contracts and expands. Um, and then your little alveole like that. And here's a picture of the contracted, irritated airway with mucus in it. You can see there's not a lot of room for airflow in there. And that's what an asthma attack looks like. These muscles, muscles squeeze down, they cause turbulent airflow and not a lot of airflow through there and then uh, the irritation causes secretions also. So the blood flow to the alveoli. You've got your pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins. Artery red, vein blue. They come down and break into little capillaries like this. Um, and each, each little alveolus has a huge network of capillaries. Capillaries are single cell walled blood vessels, and that's where the gas exchange happens. So you, uh, the gas has to diffuse across the single cell <coughs> wall of the alveoli and also through the single cell wall of the um, blood capillaries here, and then the gas exchange happens. All of the blood that goes through our body goes through the lungs, unless there's an anomaly in the heart. Um, but that's a huge amount of blood flow that gets distributed throughout the lungs with every heartbeat. So I can't remember the exact number of uh, length or the surface area of capillaries, but it's enormous. So, and there's millions of alveoli in the lungs. Half, half, half the blood goes to the body. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. So, um, so uh, Opposite of your tissues, um, you've got, normally in your tissues, you've got oxygenated blood that comes down and goes to the tissues, and then deoxygenated blood goes back to the heart. It's opposite in the lungs. You've got deoxygenated um, blood going to the alveoli, get, picking up oxygen, and then going back to the left side of the heart, it's red. So that's where it's opposite. Your pulmonary artery is actually deoxygenated, your pulmonary vein is actually oxygenated. So. Um, yeah, which makes sense. Um, and then the alveolar sacs contain a substance. There's not a picture of it in here, but it's called surfactant. Um, the surfactant helps to decrease the surface tension. These alveolar sacs are like balloons, and they want to deflate. Um, but the surfactant helps hold that tension and helps hold them open. That's important for uh, people with like cystic fibrosis, that's surfactant, uh, and alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. I think that's the name of it. There's a couple diseases out there where people don't produce surfactant. So it's important if you run into a patient like that, um, you give them teeth to hold these alveoli open. If they don't have their surfactant, they're gonna have collapsed lungs really easily. Also, um, preterm infants, don't develop surfactant. I think it's until 
week 32 or 34 in utero that they get surfactant. So if you come on to a preterm delivery, that baby's not going to have the alveoli or not. It's going to be like blowing up a fresh balloon. It's really hard to get those inflated. So you use the peak, you said? Peak. Yeah. Okay. And peep. then um, how do they treat that? Um, there are surfactants that you can inhale and medications that can help keep those open. Uh, there's artificial surfactants. So they would just do breathing treatments on a daily basis? I mean, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? I'm trying to make sure I don't miss any test questions in my lecture. Because <laughs> I didn't write the test. Okay, so more on the blood flow. So deoxygenated blood comes to the right side of the heart. Uh, through the right atrium and right ventricle, and then up through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, brings deoxygenated blood to the lungs, goes to the alveoli through the capillary system, gets oxygenated, and comes back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, gets pumped to the left ventricle, and out the aorta to the rest of the body, the head and the body. Any questions on that one? Now, sometimes there's um, anomalies where there's uh, connections between the pulmonary vein and the aorta. So the deoxygenated blood actually goes out the aorta, um, or the oxygenated blood goes back to the lungs. It's more likely it goes from high pressure to low pressure system. Um, and then, then sometimes there's a connection between the right and left atrium. And rarely there's a, a little hole between the ventricles, but that's pretty rare. More, more likely the so sometimes you're not going to have normal physiology on these patients, and they're going to have either high or low um, oxygen sats and higher pressures in the lungs. As you can imagine, if, so the blood pressure coming out of this thing is high, right? But you already got a high blood pressure because the left ventricle is pushing up out. And the pulmonary artery is a nice fragile vein. It's a low pressure system. So if you have high pressure connection here in a low pressure system, um, you're going to have high vascular pressures in the lungs that can make ventilation difficult and oxygenation difficult. And then the, when the pulmonary arteries still be under pretty good side pressure for contraction of the right ventricle or not? Um, decent pressure, like we're talking 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury pressure in the right-sided system and then, you know, like 120 over 60 or 80 in the left side of the system. So there's a pretty good pressure difference there. Yeah. How do you tell the uh, pressure on the pulmonary artery? Uh, we have catheters that we can put in. Uh, the catheter goes in usually right here. And we thread it down through here and then it sits right right in the right before it branches and we can monitor pressures there. So, um, there's also ultrasound Doppler flows that they can estimate pressures, but we can direct monitor pressures, which we do in the ICUs, and sometimes in the OR monitor these pressures for like pulmonary hypertension and stuff. That's The pulmonary um, artery is the site of pulmonary hypertension. The pressures are high there. Those are scan scans, yep. Okay, so on to pediatric anatomy. This is an important chart for you guys. Um, kids are not little adults. They actually have anatomical differences. Their tongues are bigger than adults. Um, their epiglottis is more flattened or omega shaped, and it's extremely sloppy, whereas adults have a firm, and, uh, I'm sorry, pediatrics is more rounded, omega shaped, and floppy. Um, adults are more firm and flatter. Um, the epiglottis level is actually different. It's higher in kids, meaning that their airways uh, is going to be a more difficult view to get a, a visualization of their pores because the airway is actually higher. Uh, that's a pretty good difference. Two levels of the spinal cord. The, the cords are in the same spot? <coughs> yep. Mm -hmm. okay. They're, they're, they're going to be moved up. <coughs> Um, the trachea in a child is smaller and shorter, obviously, because the child's smaller and shorter. Um, 
that the adult is wider and longer. This is important because it's going to be easy to um, either, if you have this much room for tube movement in that trachea before you're extubated or before you push the tube down into the right main stem, uh, it's really easy to extubate or main stem a, a small child because the trachea is so small. Okay. How many of you have young kids? Just think about how short your necks are and, and what that equates to for their trachea length and size. Um, they say the trachea in a child is about the size of their pinky. Oh. Just a little bit bigger. So their pinky or our pinky? There. So what are these do then? Uh, no, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I had a, a partner the other day and it kind of almost go by. You can, when you're picking size of an ET tube, now do not put this on a test. On a test, they're looking for actual equations, how to figure out an ET tube size. But uh, trouble, like if you're in a crash and you're looking for tubes and don't have time to calculate it, look at the child's pinky and go for a tube that's approximately that size, maybe a little bit smaller. But there's an actual way to calculate There, yeah. We'll talk about that later. The car cartilages are more flexible because they're still growing. Um, so their trachea is going to be more flexible, and it, it's, uh, because of the flexible cartilage, it collapses on itself more easily on inspiratory pressure. Whereas adults, we're done growing, and our cartilage is nice and firm. Um, the larynx itself is more funnel-shaped. Um, it's more anterior and more funnel-shaped, which just makes it harder to identify structures. Let's see. Okay, so on a kid, because their airway is up higher, their trachea, it's more of an angle for the trachea to dive down into their lungs. So uh, a lot of times on kids, you can get the breathing tube through the cords, but you, you have to like really twist it and work it down because it's a steep angle to go down to the trachea from there. Um, whereas adults, our airway is more in a straight line. The narrowest point, <coughs> people love this question, the narrowest point uh, of a child's airway is the cricoid cartilage or, or the subglottic region. And the narrowest point on an adult is going to be their glottic opening or their vocal cords. <clears throat> and then lung volumes. Uh, the maximum lung volume for a newborn is 250 ml. Obviously, for a neonate, it's going to be smaller. So that's, that's pretty small. That's like a, a cup, right? 250 ml. And then an adult, we can, our maximum lung capacity is up to six, six liters. We don't breathe six liters, obviously, with every breath, but if somebody were to inflate our lungs completely, you could fit six liters of an adult male. Just for like clarification, is, there, is that a range? Because in the book it said 5,000? Yeah. Is it just a. Uh, yeah, okay. women are going to be smaller. You know, There's body some, size yeah. is going to be big. Tall people have bigger lung surface area, short people have. So I would say four to six liters is probably a good average. And here's a picture of the anatomy of an adult. This is a, you can see here the narrowest portion is that trichocartilage, and then in an adult it's right here where the cords are. And their tongue is larger, so their, aero, uh, their oral pharynx is smaller. Less space to get your blade and more tissue to push away to get a view of the airway. Um, the teeth may or may not be developed in a child. Um, they are under the gums, though, so you can cause dental damage, even if there's not teeth actually through the gums yet. Um, airways are smaller, so it's easier to choke on things, easier to lodge things in the airway. Their head size is different. They have a bigger occiput, so if you're laying flat, that big occiput is going to push their head forward and close their airway versus an adult you lay flat your airway is open. Um, so typically how we fix that when we're intubating a patient is just put, roll the towel and put it under their shoulders to extend their neck a little bit. Just another picture. Um, their nasal cavity is also uh, less developed or smaller. The cricothyroid membrane, where you trach a kid, um, tracheostomies are contraindicated in people under eight years old because that 
The structures are so small and the membrane isn't fully developed yet, so you can cause long-term issues on a kid if you spoke that. Now, would I consider it if the baby's going to die? I might try it. But according to all the books, and probably in a court of law, it's contrary. But if you save someone's life, it's going to help, right? <coughs> Um, another thing, because their airways are smaller, even just a little bit of mucus is going to clog the airways easier than uh, it would in an adult. Um, and when you're starting out with a small airway, just a little bit of those smooth muscles constricting, bronchoconstriction or asthma, they're really going to have some serious issues because they're already starting with a small airway. So, some more physics for you. This is Purcell's law. Um, of airway resistance. Basically, it says that the bigger the airway, the, the less resistance, the better, better, more um, laminar flow. The smaller the airway, the more resistance to airflow and the more turbulent flow. So you want nice laminar, not, uh, low resistance airways to get air down to the alveoli sac. Any questions on anatomy? Can you just repeat that? Sort of <laughs> <laughs> the the is it the same? It's the same as. It's the same with the catheter and the tubing for the IV? Uh huh. Okay. Yep. Same law. Yep. Okay. Um, an interesting. I don't think you guys have to know these laws. I had to know them in anesthesia school, but um, an interesting thing to note with this equation is the radius of the vessel or the tube or whatever is to the fourth power. So. Um, and it's in the denominator. So if your radius decreases by two, it's actually decreasing by a heck of a lot more than two. So it makes a huge difference. Basically what I want you to get out of this slide is that uh, it, it, you should think about, like in a bronchoconstriction or asthmatic patient, how actually, why it's so hard to get air in and out is because you're working through little tubes like this. Also, when you intubate a kid on an ambu bag, it might be harder because um, you're pushing air through a tiny little tube versus like a big, open adult airway. Any other questions? Okay. You guys want to take a break now or keep going on the physiology? Break? Break. How long? Okay.